Welcome to this episode of the Down the Pub podcast. I am your host, Anthony Abbott. This is our first episode of 2022. And on this episode, I'm excited to uh, announce that we have Alex DeCarolis. Alex, of course, owns his own uh, f- football agency called ADC, the Players Agency. Last week, it was announced that uh, one of his clients, Alejandro Dorada, was taken over as assistant coach to Stephen Hart at Halifax. So I got to get the lowdown on uh, Alejandro, got to learn a little bit more about his football philosophy, uh, what he'll bring to the Wanderers, uh, how the move came about, and um, what we can expect uh, going forward, um, and what his ambitions are. Uh, On the second half of the show, because it's slightly extended this week, uh, is a new section of the show called The Last Call. Um, On this section of the show, I talk to you, the people. regular people um just want to go back to kind of the roots of the show when we used to talk about how people's clothes were doing get people's points of view rather than just having the stock media answers to an awful lot of what's been happening so um i reached out to my good friend dave robinson dave is the founder of everton nova scotia and we had a good chat about the situation that everton finds themselves in with Rafa on the lookout for a new manager, um, the financial fair play situation where they could be in a situation where they get, could lose points, um, a lot of wasted money on some bang average players and kind of where where the club goes and who Dave would like to see come in as a manager. So yeah, um, it's it was great to kind of get back and just uh, talk, um, just talk some footy um, with, with with some of my buds. So yeah, um, please check that out. That's in the second half of the episode. Um, you can follow the show on Instagram and Twitter at Down the Pub Pod. Please give us a shout. Um, if you would like to come on the show and be part of the last call, you're more than welcome to uh, just reach out to me on social media and we can set something up. And if you could go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe to the show and leave us a review and a rating, that would be really appreciated because it does help uh, with the everything that we're trying to do here on the Down the Pub podcast. It kind of gives us a little bit of sway, a little bit of push. And also now on Spotify, uh, they have a reviewing system where you can give five stars. So if you're a Spotify listener, go in there, give the show a five stars. I would really, really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so uh, here's the first part of the uh the episode is the big interview with uh, Alex de Carolis. So uh, here we go. We are joined by one of the Wanderers' favorite sons, uh, Alex de Carolis. It's uh, your third time on the show, buddy. Uh, welcome back to the show. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, third time is the charm. So I'm uh, I'm glad to be back. And yeah, thank you again. Yeah, no worries. Uh, I just thought it'd be a good time to. Obviously, we had the big news of. Um, the, you uh, helping uh, Alejandro Dorado come to the club, but I just thought it'd be a good time as well just to catch you up and see how everything's progressing with the uh, with the agency. So how's things been going? Yeah, no, it's uh, been very good. Obviously, this is the the busy time of the year for for players, for agents. I mean, the window is open now. This month, next month, even December was busy. So I mean, I moved back from Sweden. I'm now in. Um, I will be in Toronto in about a week and a half, two weeks. So I'll be there permanently, but. It's going well. Um, uh, obviously, as you guys saw, I have a coach now um, contracted. I have five or six players that are all pending deals. So, um, and new players are coming every day to me. So, I mean, it's it's uh, it's a very busy time. Um, I think it's a good learning curve I've had this off season. Um, I've kind of learned what to say, what not to say, the right times to to um, introduce people. So, it's a good first year to kind of just get thrown into the deep end basically so no everything's been going pretty well has it been eye-opening like being on the other side of the agency because like obviously normally you were in the seat as a player um uh, has it been eye-opening for you to see what goes on behind the scenes absolutely yeah i mean it's um it's a complete different game that people don't understand uh when you're on this side of it it's not so much simple where you just like a player, you sign the player and then he becomes the team's player, you know, like it's a lot of thought process that goes into it. Um, especially me as the agent. I mean, I get somewhere between 50 to hundred highlight tapes a week from different players around the world. And obviously highlight tapes, they are meant to be very good. So players look better than they are. I mean, even myself as a player, I mean, I would always edit my highlight tapes to make me look better. So, I mean, 
there's tricks you can do, but then you have to really research the player and almost more important research the player as a person because there's people that can play the part, but then they don't will end up being well, you know? And then if that's a player you present to clubs, if it doesn't work out, then you kind of lose credibility, right? So it's a very fine line of players that you can be presenting to clubs. Um, I also have a lot of agents that I'm working with that are sending me their players. So it's a lot of vetting to make sure you're getting someone that you're happy with going to your contacts because at the end of the day, it's a game of contacts. If I send players to someone and they don't do well, my contact gets ruined. Right. So it's a whole matter of kind of dealing with that, but it's uh, from the outside looking in. I mean, the average fan has no clue what goes on in the backroom talks, um, but it's, uh, it's been exciting. I mean, I've kind of went to school to do this, so I'm, I've, wasn't experienced in the work field, but I kind of had ideas of what was going, what would be going on. And it's kind of what I expected. So is, is this the, the reason for the move back to Toronto? Is that you feel like your, your base is going to be here in North America? I think so. I mean, obviously as I grow, I want my players to be in the best leagues in the world. Um, that's Serie A, Premier League, uh, Bundesliga, like that's the goal, right? But I think that's still years away. Um, so right now, I think my best markets, I mean, as a player, I was in Scandinavia, but I was also, I played in America and I also played in Canada, as everyone knows. So I think in my first early years, it's easiest for me to be in North America. Um, most of my clientele and my contacts are here. Um, just last week, I had to go to Rochester, New York. So I went there in my car three, four hours later, I was there. Whereas if I was in Sweden, that probably wouldn't have been possible. So it's going to be easier adjustment the first couple of years to kind of be here. Um, obviously, I do have some players that are in Europe right now um, on trial. So I can't be there for them now. But like I told you earlier off camera, like you can't be everywhere at all the times. Right. So for right now, I think it's the best move for me. As I grow, as I hope that I grow, I want my players in better leagues than what I'm doing, dealing with now. So if I need to move later on in life, then I do that. I mean, the good thing about the agency is all, all you really need is a working phone, no matter where you are. So if the phone works, I can be anywhere. <laughs> so uh, you mentioned that you're down in Rochester. Uh, we kind of talked a little bit off camera, but um, what's the, would it be like a, a, a new club and everybody's kind of buzzing about Jamie Vardy what did, how did you find the setup down there it was great I mean people that don't know Rochester they were the Rhinos so they were a USL championship team I think they folded four years ago um the only USL team to win the US Cup back in the day uh, but now they've rebranded as uh, Rochester New York FC so yeah Jamie Vardy owns the club um Bruno Baltazar is their head coach um UEFA pro guy from Portugal as well so it's going to be a great team. I mean, the MLS Pro is um, a very good league for young players. Um, similar kind of idea what the CPL is trying to be, but this is more dedicated to young players um, with the MLS label to it. So basically all the MLS two teams are going to be in this league with some independent teams like Rochester. So setup was great. I mean, I went to school in Buffalo, so it was kind of my neck of the woods, uh, 45 minutes away from where I used to, to live for four years. So um, I had a player there um, next week, next month, sorry, they have preseason and I have two players that are invited to preseason there. So um, it's going to be good. Um, it's a great club. It's close to where I live. So it's pretty easy for me to go check them out this year. But uh, I think it'll be a good league. Yeah, I, I mean, it's uh, as we were kind of talking about there, like it just it's the fact that they're going to be in amongst the big boys, really. So it's going to be a great uh advert for for players to to get in there so they can get seen by uh, other mls teams huh i think so i mean if i was a young canadian player or american but canadian player i would be heavily looking at the mls pro um i think that's one of the best things you can be in for a young player um every game you're playing against an mls2 team plus if your owner is jamie vardy i mean i know it sounds i know it sounds crazy that you have a good year there and you can go somewhere big but what other owner in the world has a story that he has, right? This guy was nothing until 26, 27, and now he's Premier League and plays for England, right? So, I mean, if there's anyone who can have the story of making it from nothing, it's him and he's the owner of that team, right? So um, it's a selling league. It's a selling team. Um, I think they're going to be a very competitive team as well, but the league is meant for players to move on. Um, so if I was a young player, which I have two of them now, um, they're 
excited about what it could do for their potential and what it could do for their future. And uh, just time will tell. So for the uninitiated, um, you know, like we, we hear these kind of terms like combines and something that like people in Europe probably have no idea what, what a combine is. So, so what actually happens at the, these combines? So the one I went to last week, I mean, each one is different. You have some combines that are open. So literally anyone can just fill out the waiver, sign up, pay the due and go train. Um, I don't recommend those for players that are of higher level because those combines usually have players that have no business being there. Um, again, everyone has a dream. Everyone wants to be a pro. Um, so, I mean, I don't fault those guys for giving it a shot, but those combines are kind of just go play and whatever happens, happens. Um, the combines that I try to get my players to, if they don't get contracts directly, would be ones that are invite only. Um, so what that means is the club has to literally invite the player to go, which shows that they're heavily interested in the player to begin with because those are only limited number of spots. So that being said, player gets invited and it's 20 to 30 players that are there, all that are invited and it's first team coaches all taking a look at them. And the one I'm going to next month is a five day one. So it's five days of basically two, three hour trainings, playing lots of games and give you a proper week to really show yourself. Um, I did my share of those as a player kind of before <laughs> I became a like professional, like just trying to make it out of college. And they're not, they're very, very difficult. They're not um, the best way to show yourself. I mean, you're playing with guys that have never played with, you don't even know their name. They don't pass you the ball because they're trying to like go for themselves. So it's, a, it's, it's not an easy situation to be in, but at the end of the day, there's millions of players and only hundreds of jobs. Right. So you need to get in somewhere, but uh, the invite ones are usually a bit more structured in sense that all the players there are invited and they can play, right? There, there's no bad players there. So everyone kind of gets the purpose of it and why to go. And I, ideally, you want to be at a level where you don't have to try out anymore. But for young players, that's always the case, right? Because you're unproven. So, yeah, that, it goes. That, I think the Wonders did something like that when they started. They had like, a, you paid $200 and you got to go and try out for them and stuff like that so i, I i'd say on the on the, the flip side of it it's a good money making thing for the clubs too you know if somebody's paying 250 quid you know it's easy money really just let them go play do their thing and then you know you move on i guess right of course i mean of course like there's there's just like the club needs to make money too right and i mean that's the perfect way to do it you have 100 guys there and you pay 50 100 bucks each then like that's pretty well for the club right then i mean i think the cpl did open tryouts the very first year i mean i'm not saying those were money grabs but like how many of those players actually got into CPL teams, maybe four or five. Right. So um, it's pretty normal in North America to have that model. Um, I think in Europe, it's more common that you, they don't do that. They just like invite one or two players to train with the first team. Like that's kind of what the standard is in Europe. And to be fair, um, the CPL does that as well in season. I mean, I've had a couple of my players train with Ottawa, uh, Halifax, York, um, they go and train with the first team. So, I mean, that's ideally the best situation because then like the player can't hide, right. He's either at the level of your team or he's not at the level of your team. And that's kind of what most teams do now. Um, just in the off season, it's another way to kind of generate money and to generate players you might not have seen in the past. Yeah. I think one of your players I saw on your Instagram was a, uh, Isa Abdullah, am I saying that right? Isa, mm. yeah. Isa uh, he, Abdullah. Yeah, he was, with, uh, he was at York and then he trained with the Wanderers. So how did he find the experience in Halifax? Yeah, he liked it. I mean, he was at York for a week. Uh, he was at Halifax for about a week and a half. Uh, top player. That's one of my players for the future. Um, I think he has tremendous potential. So before he came from the TFC Academy, uh, from there, he um, he went straight to Albania and played for FK Partizani under 21 as a 17 year old. And I mean, for those that don't know, Partizani, their best team in Albania every year, more or less. Um, they're always in the Champions League or Europa League qualifying like they're always an, a European powerhouse, not powerhouse, but a European club that is at that level. And he played for the under 21s as a 17 year old. And the crazy thing is, is that he doesn't have a European passport. So he went. Oh there as a Canadian, which for people that don't realize the importance of that, um, for a foreigner to play in Europe, they take up international spot and they have to pay them more. And usually they don't go foreigner unless they have something in house. Right. So 
he beat out their domestic players and he played almost every game for the under 21s, um, which is tremendous. Um, absolutely tremendous. And when he was in trial in Halifax, I mean, I've obviously you know everyone knows I know all the guys there. So he did extremely well from what I was told. Um, he does have offers from teams in the league and he does have offers in Kosovo and in um, Albania as well. So it's kind of about picking out what's best for him. Um, I think he's going to be a tremendous player for the future. Um, I'm really excited about to see where he develops. So it's just kind of about making sure that first senior fit is the one for him and we'll see what happens. Uh, you heard the name here first, uh, Isa Abdullah. Um, so I saw that you're, all, you're also now an official agency on transfer market. That must, that must be like, kind of kill cool, like a, you know exciting just to kind of click online and see your agency in there man <laughs> yeah I, I, I was trying to pull a fast one on transfer market to to sign myself to have my own to have an extra client on my agent profile but they, I, I think they saw through that one but uh, <laughs> no but it's, but it's it's good though it's good i mean it's um it's uh yeah it's a cool step i mean it gives you a little bit more credibility to players that i mean Still to this day, I mean, I'll have players that have no idea what CPL is, for example, and they'll ask, like, where can you help me? So I'll say Canada, and they'll say, oh, MLS. And I'm like, uh, maybe, but probably for the CPL, and they have no clue what that is. So kind of just having a transfer market with now Alejandro is on there as my clients. I mean, that kind of puts credibility to it as well. But, I mean, transfer market, it has its flaws and it has its positives, right? I mean, positives is it shows your stats. It shows where the players kind of played, but like, I think the market values are completely wrong for some players. Um, but sometimes that's all people look at. I know players in Europe that are much higher than CPL level that have much lower transfer market values just because they don't follow those leagues as much as the CPL, you know? So you have to kind of take it with a grain of salt, but, um, for credibility, it does kind of help me a bit. I mean, the goal is to have that list filled, right? But that's going to take time. But, you know, it was, it was good to be on it. So um, you mentioned there, like, Alejandro, and it's obviously the big news for you, and it's big news in the city here. So uh, how did how did that connection come about? Yeah, so maybe it was – timing was pretty co- crazy, but it was maybe a week or two after I kind of launched my agency for the very first time. Like, when I put it all on social media, like, it was just kind of – um, I was brand new. Right. And his lawyer, um, reached out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, she saw my post on, um, uh, LinkedIn and then she's like, Hey, I have a coach. Um, please check him out, whatever she said. And like at that time I was getting like, I don't want to sound sarcastic, but hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of messages. Cause it was brand new. Right. So I just blasted it on social media and it was an influx of people. So, I didn't get to him. I didn't get back to him for maybe a couple of days, a week or two, just because I was too many messages. And then, of course, like I saw it and I was like, OK, like, what are the odds? Right. Like, what are the odds? This guy needs my help. Like his CV is up here. Right. Then I'm just starting. So anyway, um, I finally got back to her. Um, I also I was kind of like, OK, is this a fake? Because, I mean, LinkedIn, you never know. Like, there's so many people on there that have no like they're just fake. Right. So I was yep. kind of that was in my mind as well. So I was like, you know what? Like, I have nothing to lose. Like, give me his number. I'll give him a call. I'll, I'll video call like this just to kind of see um, who he is, right? And sure enough, it was him. Um, and we've been talking since that would have been what? In June, July. And we've been talking almost every day since. Um, his goal was always, is always to get to the top league in England. He wants to be Premier League coach. Um, and I think he will get there eventually. Um, but he also wanted to try North America. He knows the CPL. He knew it before he knew me and, or MLS is where he wants to go. Um, so we've been, I've just been kind of grooming him to kind of get there. To be honest, I didn't think it was going to be possible just because coaches are very hard to get into the leagues. It's not as easy as players. I mean, most of my contacts that I have in the CPL, for example, are the coaches, right? So you can't really go to them and say, Hey, I have a coach for you because that's taking their job. (laughs) So it's about finding a team that is in need of a head coach or is in need of an assistant coach and that they met mash. Right. So, um, basically I've been grooming him. Um, when I found out that, uh, Mezut was going to be taking the under 23 job, um, obviously then I knew an assistant job was going to be coming into place and, um, just got in touch with Matt Fegan that I had this guy. Um, 
Then we basically went over a couple interview processes. He met with Steven, he met with Matt, he met with uh, Derek Martin and um, yeah, everything was smooth. And I mean, he had other offers too. Um, that's what people don't know. It wasn't just Halifax was his only option. He was interviewed by another club in the CPL and he was, he had a job offer from a team in England, a uh, really high championship level team. Um, but he, we chose that Halifax was the, the best fit for him at the time and what his goals are going to be. Wow. Um, so like in terms of like, as you said there, like he, he, you, you guys chose Halifax. So how did, it, how did you sell the city itself? Because obviously Halifax is not on the world football map just yet. So how did you sell the city to him? I mean, basically just told my whole life experience of my two years there, right? I mean, for people that don't know, I mean, Halifax, I mean, even before I got there, my first year as a player, I had no idea what Halifax was. I mean, I know of Halifax, obviously, but I didn't know how nice it was and what the people were going to be like. I just figured it was another Canadian city. Um, I think for him, for Halifax, I mean, one, the fans are probably the best in the CPL. Like that's been like that since day one. So he's going to have the fans approval right off the bat. Um, but it's also a low pressure situation compared to if he was to go to England right off the bat, you know, I mean, you can afford to kind of work your way into to how you want to build a team. Um, I'm not saying that's the fans like losing and they enjoy losing, but it's a bit less pressure than what it's like in Europe. When he comes here, him and Steven are going to work really well together. In my opinion, I think Steven shares the same philosophies that he does. Um, with no disrespect to Mesut or to Derek before that, um, Derek King. Um, I don't think that assistant coach has kind of been at that level of Steven. I mean, Steven's brain is at a next level when it comes to soccer. And I mean, I think Alejandro, well, I know Alejandro has that same level brain. So I think the two of them are going to really connect and really want to play how Steven has always kind of wanted to play. I think now he's going to have an extra coach to kind of um, push him along those lines, you know? And I mean, that's, what I think Alejandro liked. I think he likes a project. He likes building. And I think he likes soccer minded people as well. So, and he's inheriting a good team. I mean, I know Halifax finished six this year, but I don't think they're a sixth place team. Right. I think a couple of results go their way. They're in the playoffs and who knows what happens in the playoffs. Right. So he's inheriting a good team um, with a coach, a head coach who is very open to learning more and to helping him move on as well. So, I think it should be a good fit. Um, obviously, that's the agent saying that, but now we got to see what <laughs> happens in training camp and what they can do because they are a good team. The fans are there. Everything is there for Halifax to be good. It's just it needs to happen because now it's year four, right? So now, like, results need to come. So uh, has he got to watch many games? Like, has he been watching game tapes of the Wanderers? And what's he kind of what's he kind of thought of the the way that they play? And uh, I'm sure he's seen ways he can try and, he can help too. Yeah, no, I mean, so when I first talked to him before, I told him, hey, like, I gave my one soccer account. Um, I told him, hey, like, and plus he has Instat, Wise got all those programs to watch players. So I'm like, in case something were to happen, like, make sure you kind of are following the CPL. Like, you know what the teams are, what the players are. Um, and like, what well, people don't realize, this guy like lives and breathes soccer. Like, he knows every player in the league. He knows how players play. Like, he's a proper player developer. Um, so he's been watching Halifax for months. It's not like this job just came and he just watched a hundred games just to kind of get an idea. Like, no, like he's been following them like for months. Right. So I think that's what people don't realize. I think when they hire him, they might think, oh, he has no idea what Halifax is the CPL. Like, no, like he's been following the league for some time. I mean, he turned down a championship team in England, um, to come wow. here. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty, that should tell you something about what his goals are. I mean, his goals are to be a Premier League coach, right? That's his, like, number one dream. And, I mean, he's delaying that by coming to Canada, which I think is the great, the right move for him. Um, so, I think you guys are getting – well, Halifax is getting someone who is young, dedicated, and, like, ready to go to the next level. So, um, I'm sure you saw, like, a, like the – the, the little teaser that the club put out uh, and stuff like that, like how this kind of blew up on social media. Um, were you surprised at how how excited? Because it's you know it's it's an assistant coach kind of thing. It's not like we're talking about like you know a twenty goal a season striker. It's an assistant coach. But were you surprised at how much traction this whole thing got on social media? 
I think so. I mean, I think the word got out of the bag the day before. I mean, it wasn't, I mean, it was a good teaser, but I mean, if you see the Real Madrid shirt, you see the UEFA pro shirt and the UEFA shirt. And then, I mean, if you look at my Instagram, my last post was him. Right. So <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure it wasn't the most like FBI type of post, but um, no, I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, there isn't a coach in the league that has his experience. Right. And he's going to be as the assistant. I mean, there are good coaches in the league. There, there definitely are. But there's no one that has a UEFA pro who came from probably the best team in the world's youth academy for six years, coached under, I mean, say what you want, but Rafa Benitez, he's had a rough couple of years, but one of the best coaches probably ever, right? Like he is in that, like, you. it's not crazy to say that he is at that level. So the experience he has, the connections he has with the players, with um directors around the world i mean he's bringing that to halifax right it's a tremendous asset for halifax to have now to have him in his they're in their back pocket um and i mean what people want to understand like he's not going to be the one winning you the games on the field but what he does monday to saturday is what's going to separate halifax in my opinion from some teams because if you play sundays and he trains a full week it's going to change how the players play i mean you see it all the time um when coaches come to new teams and some players are become different players, you know, like that's all because of a coaching. It's not because the player got better overnight. Right. Or when a new coach comes to a new team, the team didn't get better. It's how they were coached. That's how they got better. Right. And I mean, I think if him and Steven mash well, which I'm fully expecting to happen, I, I think that can be a big surprise for Halifax. Cause at the end of the day, like I said earlier, Halifax has the players. They have the right players to probably win, in my opinion. Like, they're at that level. I mean, you don't just come second and then come six in one year. Pretty much the same players, more or less. Um, so they have the players. It's Now it's just about fine-tuning some things, which I think Alejandro will help bring. Well, I mean, like, we finished second with you, and then you left, and then we finished sixth. Do you think that was a big factor in it? Of course, I have, to say, I, have, I have to say that. I have to say that. And if and if, uh, if if Matt if Matt and Stephen are listening to this, they they, they should they should sign me right now because I'm still healthy and I'm still fit. But no, I mean you never know, right? Those, those island games. I mean, there's a tournament setting, right? I mean, if you get two or three bad games in a row, you're not going to make the playoffs right off that, right? I mean, we got hot at the right time. Um, we we clicked at the right time. I think what people don't understand at that for our team that year, I mean, our team chemistry was through the roof. Um, when you put guys in a hotel for, what was it, six, seven weeks, like you have to like each other because if you don't, you're going to just crumble. And I mean, that's what I think some teams did. Um, I think if it was to be a full season with normal, like normal, no COVID season, I don't know if we would have finished second. Maybe we would have been maybe third or fourth or fifth, but in a tournament setting, it's a bit different because you really have to like each other. And that's what we had that year. Um, I don't know too much what the locker room vibe was this year. Maybe it wasn't as strong, but um, nonetheless, I mean, we just got hot at the right time and in, in tournament play, like anything can happen. Right. So yeah, that's what I think. With, with the, the way the league is going now, like you've got Forge, Pacific came along this year and Calvary. So they're, they're kind of like, they are ahead of, the rest of the, the league, you kind of got like York, Valor, and Halifax kind of in that next little group, and then Ottawa and Edmonton, I'd say, just kind of pull up the rear. So do you think this is like a serious message to the rest of the league that Halifax means business this year, that like bringing in a coach of this caliber, UA for pro license, and do you think that we have enough to bridge that gap to, to, to kind of take on Forge? I would hope so. I mean, give credit to, to, to Halifax. I mean, what people don't understand, like you can't just make a team, a pro team, and then be good right off the bat, right? Forge has Sigma Academy, which is the best academy in Canada. Um, half the national team players came from Sigma, right? So they're designed to play a certain way from when they're kids. Their coach was Bobby, who's been like that since day one, and he brings those players to Forge. Right? So they already have a system of play. Calgary has the Foothills. Um Pacific, I mean, all those BC guys are the same. I mean, Halifax started from nothing, right? So um, I think what Halifax needs to do from an unbiased perspective is they need to build an academy first to kind of create a philosophy of play before you can kind of just have good first teams because it's not easy to 
bring 20 guys from out of province to go be do good. You know, I mean, there's good players in Nova Scotia. Don't get me wrong. There is, but there's not enough to take 20 players from Nova Scotia and be competitive. Right. I mean, Ontario, you can do that because it's the biggest province, right? Nova Scotia, you just can't get your 20 best players and think you're going to be good. Right. So you're going to have to build an academy. And I think that's what they have intentions. I mean, that they, I have been hearing that is in the works. So I think the under 23 team that they're making is the perfect, perfect step to do this because that's going to attract younger players to come. Even if they're not first team ready or off the bat, they can develop and they can learn and how Halifax wants to play. Um, I think Mezut's going to be a perfect role for that. I think that's where kind of he shines. I think he'll be excellent for that. And even Alejandro, my, my guy, I mean, he comes from a youth background. Um, his whole specialty is youth players and kind of developing them. Right. I mean, he was at the Real Madrid youth Academy. Like that is, there's no better youth Academy in the world. So he comes from that background as well. So I think they're making good steps for the long term. I think it's a very good long-term play. Um, but also in the short term, I mean, he's a, he coached in China, which is at the highest league with Rafa. He coached in Finland, top league. Um, he's coming from a top, top pedigree as well. And mix that with Steven. Um, the two of them are going to work wonders this year. And it's a good short term and it's a good long term play. Yeah, like we're, I'm, I'm really excited to uh, to see what happens. Obviously, like Wanderers Wednesdays, we're going to have some player announcements. But this was one that just like, like, exploded out like, and I was like this is going to be a great thing for the city so yeah we're all really excited here um, can we expect to see at a Wanderers game this season I hope so I mean that, that's in the works um, I'm definitely I mean now that I'm in Toronto it's easy for me to get to Halifax pretty simply so um, yeah I mean I'm invested in Halifax again right I thought that was going to be done and dusted with Halifax <laughs> but now I have a coach there right so um, no, I'm no I'm I definitely have intentions to come I mean I still think I should be playing, but that's not neither here nor there. But nonetheless, I mean, um, no hard feelings. I'm definitely going to be back. Um, it's just about finding the right times that fit my schedule. But um, no, I'm, I definitely look forward to it. I'll be in the kitchen for sure. So we'll have to plan plan a home game for me to come. Yeah, man, it'll be, it'll be a lot of fun. And uh, I'll, I'll buy you a beer and I'm sure Derek will get you a free ticket. So um, I hope so. But, <laughs> yeah. So for, for people to find you again on, on, uh, on social media, uh adc where where can they go yeah my uh my website is www.adcplayersagency.com um my email is the same thing for the www uh, my instagram is uh at adc players agency and my twitter is the same so um basically if you go to my private instagram i'm it's all linked there so instagram has kind of been the biggest uh linkedin is also pretty good in the professional world as well, but I'm all over there. So I'm sure if you just kind of search my name, you'll, you'll find it somewhere. Well, we're excited. I'm excited to see how uh, January pans out for you, man. It sounds like you've got like a lot of orange in the fire. So um, thanks again for hanging out. Um, I'm sure people in the city here are going to love to hear uh, uh, about Alejandro and uh, everybody's kind of dying for like little bits of information on them. So I really appreciate you uh, giving us some insight into the man himself. So um, absolutely. I'll talk to you soon, man. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Anthony. All right, Desperados, last call. Why you laughing for? I'm being serious. I'm being serious. No, you see, no, you see, I'm talking fuck. See, I don't do if, buts, and maybes. I do absolutes. And, you know, like, if your aunt had balls, she'd be your uncle. But she doesn't, so she's not. You know what I'm trying to say? I'm sorry. 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 I'm Everything are heavily in the news right now. So I just thought I would get Dave's thoughts on uh, what's been happening at the club. Welcome to the show again, Dave. Thanks for having me back, mate. Yeah, it, it seems a little bit, um, it just sounds a little bit, it just seems a little bit different from the last time you were on the show. And the last time you were, you were on the show, we were interviewing Everton legend, uh, Kevin Ratcliffe. And there was like a ton of like positivity around the club with Carlo in charge and and we now seem to have done a full 180. So I just thought it'd be great to get some some thoughts on what's happening. So 
I just want to get your reaction, first of all, to uh, obviously the news over the weekend was uh, Mr. Benitez being shown the door. Do you think that should have happened in a lot sooner or um, how was your whole uh, thoughts on uh, how that went about? Um, well, I, I, I don't think there was really much choice at that point, but to get rid of him, you lose to Norwich. He'd won one game in 13 Premier League games. I think it was like three and 17 in total and a couple of those were scraping past Norwich at home and beating Hull in the cup just. So the football was terrible. The the manager was grating on people as as he tends to do. So it, it probably should have happened sooner, to be honest. Um, it, it kind of felt inevitable that he was going to go eventually. Um, why they left him so long, we'll, we'll probably touch on that. Um but yeah, it was the right decision uh, to, to to get rid of him. And I think probably the bigger question is why we ever put ourselves in that position in the first place. But again, that's something we'll come on to. Yeah, but it was the right decision to let him go for sure. I, I must say, like I, I watched the game um, on the weekend and it just looked like a team that was just devoid of structure, devoid of ideas. And I know that like players have been injured and and, and things like that. But I mean... At the end of the day, he's still responsible for putting a cohesive unit together, you know, and, and you kind of you just have to make do with the the pieces that you have. And I mean, it's not like the squad is god awful. Like there's quite a good few decent players in the Everton squad. So like do you, do you think that he lost the dressing room on top of it? Because I saw was it the Mary Gray had liked the fact that he'd been sacked on <laughs> Sky Sports or something <laughs> on, on their Instagram page. So do you think that that he'd lost the dressing room? Um, I don't know so much. He'd obviously lost individuals. The whole Luca Dean situation um, that that had happened the week before or the weeks preceding this. <laughs> the, you touched there on the structure, and I actually this is where I think a lot of Everton fans might have a bit of sympathy for for Benitez because he is just a symptom of the bigger problems that we have at the club in terms of. He's now going to be, well, the next manager will be the sixth manager in Mashiri's reign. And there hasn't, there hasn't been any overarching strategy or structure to those managers. They're like six different, very different managers. Each have brought their own players in. Each, play, each of those players play different styles of football. They don't fit into one cohesive you know, system that everyone want to play across one manager to the next. So he's got to deal with that. But like you said, it's his job to... To, to work with the pieces he has. And he it's kind of funny because Benitez comes with a reputation of being able to play organized, you know, hard to beat. It's a hard to beat team. The football's organized. It's hard to break the defense down. That that couldn't be further from the truth about how Everton have been playing since mid-September. I, I think if you look at all the, the data, we're near the bottom of the table in every defensive matrix you can you can look on and that, that includes also form through the worst team rounds conceded more goals than anyone so he just didn't seem to be able to have a, a there's no idea of how to use the, the players he had to, to to implement any sort of system um it, it started well for him so that was uh that that was that was interesting we were near the top of the table after five games but then there was injuries and he just couldn't cope after that and the team the players have to take responsibility as well but the buck stops with him. He's the manager and he wasn't setting anyone up to in the right way that they could win. He wasn't being able to manage them properly. Man management wasn't there. Um, you know, again, alienating, you're only left back at the club, blah, 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 all that sort of stuff. That wasn't helpful. Um, yeah, it's the, the club, the, the, the issues at the club are wider than Benitez, but he was not solving any of the problems and he was actively creating more problems. Uh, including in the way he was setting the team up. So, so you have to kind of feel like from an outsider looking in, um, you kind of have to feel some sort of sympathy for him too, though, because I think of those six managers you've talked about, he's probably been the only one that hasn't had a splurge of money behind him to actually go and get the players he wanted. So, I mean, like, I'm sure like the Mary Gray has turned out to be a, a really astute signing. Um, Andros Townsend, like, the way you kind of hear sometimes you think that he's like he's suddenly being messy but he's been playing really he's been playing well for what you'd expect from Andros Townsend but do you kind of feel a bit of sympathy for him that way that like I mean like everybody else seemed to get a boatload of money and then it comes to him he already has this huge 
uh, weight on his shoulders of the fact that he was Liverpool manager and then suddenly it's like the well is dry. Did you feel a bit of sympathy for him that way? Yeah, like I don't, I don't think, I think a lot of the, <sighs> Rafa's Raff been around for a long time and he's he's got a lot of mates in the media. So obviously they're reporting on this and looking at it from the outside and thinking, oh, you know, Everton fans seem to be blaming everything on Benitez. And I don't think that's actually true at all. I don't know any Everton fan who would look at all the problems at the club and go, Benitez caused them all. We all know the situation he came into. We all know the financial restrictions he was working under. And to be fair to him, that was one of the, probably the, the strengths of his his sort of brief tenure was the players he did bring in. You're right, Gray and Townsend have been fantastic, especially given the money that they, they, they were brought in for. Salomon Rondon, not so much, but, you know, he was a free transfer anyway. So it's not like we, you know, splurged 15 million pound on Umani Ass or someone like, like we did before. It was, it was a low risk move. Hasn't worked out that particular one. Um, so yes, I do feel some sympathy in terms of what he had to deal with. And then the injuries that came on top, but even at the end, Richarlison, Amina and Calvert-Lewin and Decore, who were all players who'd been out previously, were all back for the, the last game. He didn't start Richarlison or Mina, which I can kind of understand because of the fitness thing. But even when they came on, there was I think we were a fully strength team and we still couldn't get past Norwich. And Norwich are the worst team in the league currently and one of the worst probably that's been there for quite some time. Even though they have a they have also had a bit of an upturn of form recently, I guess, but it was just not good enough. And as much as Again, another thing is I don't believe the Liverpool connection, it probably affected people's thoughts initially, but in terms of why people wanted him gone, I don't think it was really a factor. Or if it was, it was very low down the, the list. Yeah, um, I, you know, like uh, the, the Rondon thing, like I, I, I feel like Benitez was still thinking of the Rondon that was at Newcastle three yeah. or four years ago. Obviously, he's gone to China, so he was playing at a, a lower level. And then... I don't think he was ever supposed to come back into the club as the main striker. But then I just said with Charleston and uh, Calvert-Lewin got injured and he's kind of like just trust into that position. And I, I kind of, I feel bad for him because he is a shadow of the player who left the Premier League. But yeah, at the same time though, it's just, he just seems to follow Benitez around everywhere. So yeah, it's not his fault. He doesn't pick himself. He gets picked. And of course he's, he's not going to turn around to the manager and say, no, I'm not going to play. Of course he's going to play. <laughs> and of course he's going to sign in the first place. It's a new contract for him. But so you have to look at the, the people responsible and that was Benitez. But then with Benitez, you have to look at the people responsible for appointing Benitez and that's the board, you know? So there's always a, a hierarchy of crap decision-making going on somewhere. <laughs> so uh, just looking at like um, so, some of the speculation in the papers, um, like the big one today, I think was in the Sun. Oh, not the Sun. Sorry, God, God, I should never mention the name here. <laughs> uh, the it was on the BBC uh, football web, uh, website um, that apparently everything have reached back out to uh, Roberto Martinez. Like, but why would they want to? Do, I don't understand going backwards. Like, what's what is the reason behind this? Well, it, we we know where that's come from. That's definitely a Bill Kenwright decision. So the, the problem is we have on the board is we have Mashiri, who's been the one who's made most of the decisions in the last few years since he arrived at the club. Um, Mashiri likes his big glamour appointments. He likes his Hollywood signings. Uh, he's got agents whispering in his ear and he's very easily swayed by that. And then we've got Bill Kenwright, who's been the chairman forever. Uh, he's very, very sentimental. He comes from a theatre background, so I think he loves the drama of, of like returning staff and all that. And he 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 appointed Martinez the first time. Martinez was manager when Mashiri took over, um, and that Martinez was the first pa- manager that Mashiri sacked. So he was a Bill Kenwright sign in the first place, uh, appointment in the first place. And I think Bill Ken, I think Mashiri's just looked at the the wreckage of what he's caused over the last years and maybe has allowed himself to be swayed this time by Bill Kenwright. And Bill Kenwright likes the romance of bringing back a manager to finish off a job he didn't get to do. But the problem is, is there were <laughs> massive fan protests to get rid of Martinez. He was awful. The first year he was there was really good. It was our best season in a long time because... Martinez does not defend. He does. He doesn't do defend. He doesn't train for set pieces. He doesn't think it's worth it because his. I think Leon Osman's autobiography said, "Well, you don't face that many in a game, so what's the point of focusing and not on training?" 
Um, and so, so defensively for him, he just doesn't bother with it. Um, but the first year he came in, the defense was still drilled from the Moyes era. Plus he added the attacking flair and that was, it was brilliant. But then as soon as the defense forgot what Moyes had taught them, they weren't learning anything from Martinez. So everything just collapsed like a house of cards. And we, some of the football we were playing in the first year was great. But then as soon as everyone learned how to, you know, combat it, there was a plan A, but no plan B whatsoever. So everyone just learned how to deal with our plan A. And it, the football got dire very quick and we were very easy to beat. Um, we'd still score goals, but we would concede twice as many. Uh, we were brittle, that we were collapsing games constantly. Um, and just the fact that yeah, once Mashiri once Mashiri sacked Martinez the first time, Martinez took him to court and got a 10 million pound settlement yes. off of Mashiri for being sacked. And now all of a sudden they're thinking about appointing him again. It's it's ludicrous, but I want the saving grace there, I think, is the Belgian FA have said it's a World Cup year. They don't want to let him go. They don't want to let him job share, which was apparently another idea floated. So I think that one's nipped in the bud. Um, I think the club have announced today Duncan Ferguson is taking over uh, for, they said, for games. We don't know how many yet, but certainly for the next one. Then there's an international break, so possibly then. So hopefully the Martinez one is dead in the water. But just the fact it was floated in the first place is just mind-boggling to me. Yeah, me too. Like, I mean, like he, he's gone to he got really lucky and got a really great job in, in Belgium with like probably the I think we we talked about this before ourselves between ourselves, with probably the one of the best squads in Europe right now. And like well, they, everyone they, falls upwards from Everton. Yeah. Like well, they, Martinez got the Belgian Belgian job, Ancelotti Madrid, Kuman um, got the Barcelona job. <laughs> None of them succeeded, but they all fell upwards. It's I don't understand it. I I, I feel like they're just great bullshitters. That's all it is. But like I just think that like you know he, like Martinez has like probably the best squad in Europe right now, and they just falter in every big tournament. I don't sure I would want that. No, in charge of my club. So you know, Rooney's been floated around. You know, the, the kind of the usual people. Like I, I, geez, I, thought, I saw one where it's like Jose Mourinho and and all this kind of bollocks. But I mean, is there anybody that kind of sticks out in your mind that you'd like to see come in? Well, uh, Sky Sports have just an hour ago tweeted that Everton have have got an interest in Mourinho, and then ten minutes later tweeted, "Oh no, that's been, that's not happening anymore." So I think you know, you've obviously got all the media just speculating and just to you know, get hits on their site. So I guess there's an element of that, but I think the the ones that do sound kind of concrete are obviously Ferguson always gets considered on a, a, a like is there on an interim basis, but he always gets considered for the permanent job, never gets it. Poor guy. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, it looks like Rooney and Lampard seem to be quite strong contenders. Um, and I'm not against either. I think probably of the two, I think Lampard did a decent job at Chelsea in quite tough circumstances. He had a transfer ban. He wasn't allowed to sign anyone. He's the one who bought through all the, you know, your Mason Mounts and your Hudson Adoys. And, you know, because he had to, he was, there was no, he wasn't allowed to bring players in because they were under an 18 month transfer ban, I think. So I think he did an okay job there. It didn't quite work out for him in the end, but I think the Rooney one is the more interesting. I know, again, I could maybe be falling into Ken Wright's trap here of the romance of it, but, the the job Rooney's doing at Derby is I just think nothing short of phenomenal. You know, they they they're 21 points deducted and now they're not even bottom of the table anymore. They'd be eleventh in the table if they hadn't had their points deduction. They've got I think he when he arrived at the club they had eight professionals and all he's been able to do is add a few free transfers and then the youth players to that to to that initial squad. And even now the players are leaving because they can't afford it. And to work in that sort of situation and do the job he's doing shows that there's definitely something there about him as a manager. Um, and I guess the argument is a lot of people are making against him. I think he'd be quite a popular appointment, but the, the argument against him is he's not experienced enough. But um, I guess the way to counter that is our last three managers have had, I, I guess, probably a thousand games each under their belt, Ancelotti, Allardyce and Benitez. And pretty much they've all been crap. And, and if you look at Everton's best managerial appointment, certainly in my lifetime, probably David Moyes and Howard Kendall, they had a couple of years each at a lower league club. So I, I don't necessarily think it's a, a, a bad option. Um, I, I think I think the Rooney one, 
I think the board needs to realize that right now the, the fans need something to unify behind as well. We need to, it's just been dire for such a long time that I think if they want to stop the, the fans from getting on the board's back, which because the board are now the target, I think they need to listen to the fans and do something that kind of gives the fans a feel good factor. So the Rooney, Rooney with Big Dunk maybe as his assistant would be a popular one. I mean, it's always a risk, of course it is, but so is everyone a risk. Every managerial appointment's a risk. I can understand the Rooney thing because he has done such an amazing job. Um, the danger, I think, as well, though, is is that like we're talking about you guys are in, what, 16th now? Like you're not that far off the, uh, the relegation zone. And it's like bringing in somebody new, like relatively new, it's, it's a very risky. I don't know everybody's a risk. But you go and risk um, somebody who's like kind of brand new to, to, to the game. It's it's kind of it's a very risky proposition, and I feel I feel pretty bad for Duncan Ferguson because just before Ancelotti came in, I think he was the interim manager. He did pretty well too. Like I mean, the, the mm, beat Chelsea, drew with yeah. Man United. You know, did and I think that's what we're looking for now. Is we're looking for someone who can get a response from the players, motivate them. You know, you, it's going to take a long time to sort the tactical side of it out. But at least with someone like Duncan Ferguson or hopefully Wayne Rooney, you would have like a short term boost from just who they are and what they mean to the club and the fans would get back behind them. And sometimes that can push you over the line. You know, we did, before um, Ancelotti left and we, were, we weren't in a very good place then. And uh, sorry, no, sorry, before Ancelotti came and Duncan Ferguson took over from Allardyce. So in between there where he beat Chelsea and all that, we were in trouble then, but his just his presence pushed Everton over the line to beat Chelsea and get the draw at Man United. And that's I guess that's what we need now, something in the short term, because we need we need to get to I don't know how many points is going to be safety this year, but we need to get there fast because our like our running's horrendous as well. We've got like a lot of the big teams at the end of the season. So between now and say five or six games before the season ends, we've got to get to the required number of points because we can't rely on the points at the end of the season. So we're going to need someone to come in and put a rocket up the asses of the players in a short space of time. And I think Ferguson did it last time. Hopefully he can do it again this time. Um, how long he's going to be in charge for, we don't know. I mean, there's like I said, there's an international break after the Villa game at the weekend. So that gives a bit of breathing room. And then I guess there's probably more of an argument for bringing Sam Allardyce in now than there was when we pointed in the first place because I think we are in real danger of going down now rather than last time I didn't think I thought it was a bit of a, a panic move um, but yeah just I'm uh, not advocating bringing <laughs> so yeah. big Sam back let's, no, make that let's make that clear make that very uh, clear yeah <laughs> so, so, so you know like, like I I, um, I kind of wanted to, to ask you a little bit as well because I know like you know you know this situation so well so the owner came in, you know, as most foreign owners come into the, the Premier League, everybody's kind of super excited. And it's like they look at the Manchester City, like what happened there and Chelsea and are expecting instant success pretty much. And I think that when you look back to Chelsea and Man City, when they started off, like they burned through a lot of money on some very average players. It was like anybody that had any ounce of pedigree was being like foisted upon them like Veron and got to Chelsea and, and stuff like that but you guys have spent a horrendous amount of money on some <laughs> very very bad players but like just look at the situation the club now like from when the, the owner took over how has it gone so wrong like what's 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 the, what's the issue of like why why are you here well I mean that's that's a that's a it's it's a complicated question, but then at the same time, not also that complicated. And I guess the answer is it's the owner, um, the way he's run the club. One thing about City and Chelsea, when they first got their money, they didn't have any of these financial fair play restrictions on them. They, they, that didn't really exist to this degree. I mean, there may have been something in place, but no one really paid much attention to it. So like City, for example, blew so much money at the beginning, but there was never any restrictions on them. There's never a consequence from that other than, you know, they'd spent too much money, but they had, they could just keep throwing money at the problem and they got it right eventually. Whereas Everton have not had that. We, the reason we can't spend is because we're broaching the financial fair play limits. Um, but the, the, it's the owner, the way it's come in, it, it, obviously there was optimism. We hadn't had money for so long. We'd been looking for an owner for uh, like a, 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 a money man for so long and we've just got when he took over we were in a relatively stable financial we've never been like 
you know, in a really healthy situation, not since the eighties, but we also had, um, we had some of the, the best young players in the world on our books at that point. We had Lukaku, we had John Stones, we had young Ross Barkley, you know, the, the, some of the assets we had in our, our team were, were fantastic. We had a really good team. We had Baines and Jagielka and Gareth Barry was at the team, you know, in his twilight years doing really well. So to take that situation, spend half a billion pounds on the squad, which is what we've spent, I think 43 players and it's cost. And to make it worse, <laughs> it, it, but the, the reason for that is, He's never had in place any sort of, I've touched on this before, but any sort of strategy in place that, you know, if you look at most successful teams or even not so successful teams, they'll have someone who's in charge of creating a structure and and an identity for the club. So when one manager leaves, they will look for someone similar. So the players don't have to then adjust to a new style and new tactics and it's you know, they might have to adjust a bit, but generally it's a similar type of manager. Everton have just, we've had six, well, we're about to get our sixth manager under under Mashiri. All of them have played different styles of football. All of them have spent ludicrous amounts of money. Um, I mean, the first, when, when, I forget who it was who signed it, maybe, I can't even remember who was in charge here, maybe Kuman, uh, when we signed three number 10s uh, in the same <laughs> summer. And it, each of them came from a different one. One was Mashiri's, one was Ken Wright's, and one was the manager's um, or, or, or brands, at least. It was director of football. And, and there's, there's too many people there making decisions, and they're, they're, none, of their, none of those decisions marry up together. There's no, no strategy for them to be working in. It's just everyone doing this anarchy. Um, and that's why when you look at the squad now, there's not that many assets that we have that have appreciated. Well, we've probably got Calvert-Lewin and Richarlison who are probably valuable players. We just sold Luca Dean on the cheap because Benitez fell out of him and then we sanctioned the sale of him to Villa and then sacked the manager a week after. You know, we don't have many players to, that we can sell on to make that money back that we spent. And and that's a big problem. We, we've not bought well at all. Uh, there's been there's been bad luck in there. There's been freak injuries, and you know, Secrets even in. when we've had a director of football, the, the owners not let him do his job. He's he's always got he's because he's, he's Iranian. Um, and Kia as it's Korea Drubtian, the agent. Um, he's also Iranian, so they're mates from you know from the football and the Iranian footballer circle. So he's always in his ear, like trying to persuade him to buy this player and that player. And Mashiri gets easily swayed by these big uh, by these agents sell, spinning a yarn for him, and and then he'll bring like El Ghazi last week. No, Benitez did not want him. He turned him down three times, but Benit- uh, Mashiri just brought him in and said, "He's your player now." You know, and that's what he did to brands. That's what he is. What he's always done. So there's too many people making decisions that aren't connecting with what anyone else's decisions are, and there's no one whose whose job it is to 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 manage that. You know, Mashiri's a law unto himself, really. He's accountable to no one. That's 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 the thing. Like, I mean, <clears throat> like I, I think Tottenham find themselves in the same position that they brought in players um, for huge amounts of money but a good bit of money and they're just stuck with them and like they think they're going to be able to recoup that money where like nobody's going to pay the money that we paid in the first place like i mean you look at man city and you look at their squad if they were to sell any of them they're going to make money off them like they just sold ferran Torres to barcelona and i think they made a profit off them in in the space of a year so like they buy wisely and the players that fit into their squad and they're still able to make them look good whereas like with tottenham we brought in on Domele for 55 million like nobody in their right mind is going to pay that sort of money to take him away from us so it's, it's just it, it, I told you know where you're coming from where you just see the club spending outrageous sums of money on players that you know they're not like like Sigerson as I kind of mentioned there like offhand but like 40 million pounds for Sigerson like like who was ever going to pay that again for you know what <laughs> no, I mean? like it, it, because he was he was 28 or so when we signed him it's he was. He, he had a good first season. Obviously, there's, you know, allegedly other issues around him at the moment, which means he's unavailable. But even the last couple of years, he was playing for us. He was 
okay, but he was never a £40 million player. And at the same time, we signed him alongside two other number 10s anyway. So his presence meant that we had to play Rooney out of position and Davy Klassen, the, the, the Ajax captain we signed, just he was sold within six months because he couldn't get in the team. So there's no... but. The, the Sigurdsson thing, I mean, we spent 28 million, I think, on Yannick Balassi or someone. And everyone loves Balassi because he really engages with the fans and he's been on a few of the podcasts recently, but he was not a very good signing. Cenk Tosin, 27 million. I think he's cost us like four million pound a goal. It, wow. Walcott, we paid 25 million pound for Theo Walcott at, at the end of his career. And he left on a free transfer because he was, he just, at the end of his contract, no one was going to buy him. And this is the sort of thing we, we keep doing, buying these aging players for big money, throwing big wages at them. And that's why we're so screwed on financial fair play. And then add in the fact we keep sacking managers, we have to pay them off. Uh, we have to pay their staff off. There's a constant turnover of staff at the club. Um, I mean, Mashiri is an accountant. That's his job. That's his profession. And he just has no, he just doesn't <laughs> seem to have any... <laughs> way of managing money it's crazy that's 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 what he does he's he was he was um alice Usmanov's accountant you know the, the uzbeki billionaire and they were at arsenal together trying to take control of the club and yeah <laughs> he's an, I, I don't understand how someone who could do that for a living could be so bad at managing money i, th- I think uh i think football is um that da- dazzles you you know it's like it's like people who put money into movies you know like it's you very rarely get a return out of it and you just get blinded by it's a big fancy toy and you can just like you know it's basically playing fifa in real life you can just pick and match and it just unfortunately for you guys this guy's just really bad at playing fifa <laughs> exactly yeah i mean the, the other thing to add in is covid has affected things because a does the money lost from fans not being there but also the transfer market is very different now. You know, you said in Dombele, you know, you spent all that money on him. You might have been able to get more back for him in a regular transfer market, but there's no way in this transfer market you could. And we've got players the same that we may have thought, oh, we'll get some money back on this player. And then all of a sudden, the transfer market means there's only a few clubs who have any money to spend. Barcelona seem to conjure out of nowhere. No idea where that's come from. But there's only a few teams of money and and it's very much a, a buyer's market now and that's no good for a Cubs trying to recoup lost money yeah. um and we're both in that boat at least you at least you're on the right side of the financial fair play by quite some yeah <laughs> quite well, some margin but we're at the other end we 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 probably will bre- breach it because it's, it's done over a three-year period and we're even with trying to stop spending so much we're still in danger of breaching it and no no club's ever done that so no one knows what the consequence is well so, but we're going to test it <laughs> uh, i'm sure like they'll give you like a a fine and then oh sorry they'll a point deduction and then you'll fight it and then you'll, you'll win because man city do it all the time so yeah it's, it's, it's just you know like if i was if i was a newcastle fan i'd be kind of like looking because obviously they're in the same boat as you guys now like 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 with money coming in behind i'd be kind of looking at the Everton model and be kind of hoping that the club doesn't go that way. And then in saying that, then they've just spent 25 million on Chris Wood and uh, what they pay for Kieran Trippier. Like, so they're not going to make any money back off those two guys, right? So, no, yeah. they're not. No, but they might keep them up. I guess that's the, their short term thing is at least to stay up. That's the, I guess that's what they have, their way of thinking. But they got a model to look at in Everton on how not to spend the money now. <laughs> So hopefully they'll <laughs> hopefully they'll look at that and think, ah, right. <laughs> so it's, it's definitely going to be an interesting uh, thing to watch over the next uh, little bit. Um, I'm I'm kind of intrigued to see what happens. Um, at least you signed some players. Tottenham haven't signed anybody. So um, for people who are Everton fans here in Nova Scotia, Dave, where can they? reach out to you and become a member of uh, the Everton Nova Scotia uh, uh, Everton Nova Scotia Sports Club. Yeah, if you go onto Twitter and it's uh, at EFC Nova Scotia, uh, we have a presence on Facebook as well. I think there's a group on there. So again, if you just search Everton Nova Scotia or EFC Nova Scotia, um, and there's there's a there's 20 or 30 of us, which is uh, for, for a little Nova Scotia, that's pretty good. We're not quite as big as the Liverpool fan club yet, but we're, we're, we're gunning for them. All, We're trying to concentrate live- on ourselves at the minute. <laughs> We're in all- defensive mode at the moment. <laughs> always living in the, always living in Liverpool shadows, huh? Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, man, I, I really appreciate you taking the time out to to get us up to speed on what's happening at Everton, and uh, I, I really hope that um, 
they kind of see sense and maybe listen to the fans a little bit. But unfortunately, when people have money, they don't tend to listen to anybody. So um, I'll yeah. tell a billionaire what to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mill Man. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Oh, fuck.